Anne of Avonlea. Final chapter, chapter 30, A Wedding at the Stone House. The last week in August came. Miss Lavender was to be married in it. Two weeks later, Anne and Gilbert would leave for Redmond College. In a week's time, Mrs. Rachel Lynde would move to Green Gables and set up her lairs and penates in the erstwhile spare room, which was already prepared for her coming. She had sold all her superfluous household plenishings by auction and was at present reveling in the congenial occupation of helping the Allens pack up. Mr. Allen was to preach his farewell sermon next Sunday. The old order was changing rapidly to give place to the new, as Anne felt, with a little sadness threading all her excitement and happiness. Changes ain't totally pleasant, but they're excellent things, said Mr. Harrison philosophically. Two years is about long enough for things to stay exactly the same. If they stayed put any longer, they might grow mossy. Mr. Harrison was smoking on his veranda. His wife had self-sacrificingly told him that he might smoke in the house if he took care to sit by an open window. Mr. Harrison rewarded this concession by going outdoors altogether to smoke in fine weather, and so mutual goodwill reigned. Anne had come over to ask Mrs. Harrison for some of her yellow dahlias. She and Diana were going through to Echo Lodge that evening to help Miss Lavender and Charlotta IV with their final preparations for the morrow's bridal. Miss Lavender herself never had dahlias. She did not like them, and they would not have suited the refined retirement of her old-fashioned garden. But flowers of any kind were rather scarce in Avonlea and the neighboring districts that summer, thanks to Uncle Abe's storm and Anne and Diana thought that a certain old cream-colored stone jug usually kept sacred to doughnuts, brimmed over with the yellow dahlias, would be just the thing to set in a dim angle of the stone house stairs against the dark background of red wallpaper. I suppose you'll be starting off for college in a fortnight's time, continued Mr. Harrison. Well, we're going to miss you an awful lot, Emily and me. To be sure, Mrs. Lynde will be over there in your place. There ain't nobody but a substitute can be found for them. The irony of Mr. Harrison's tone is quite an untransferable to paper. In spite of his wife's intimacy with Mrs. Lynde, the best that could be said of the relationship between her and Mr. Harrison, even under the new regime, was that they preserved an armed neutrality. Yes, I'm going, said Anne. I'm very glad with my head and sorry with my heart. I suppose you'll be scooping up all the honors that are lying around loose at Redmond. I may try for one or two of them, confessed Anne, but I don't care so much for things like that as I did two years ago. What I want to get out of college course is some knowledge of the best way of living life and doing the most best with it. I want to learn to understand and help other people and myself. Mr. Harrison nodded. That's the idea exactly. That's what college ought to be for, instead of turning out a lot of B.A. so chock full of book learning and vanity that there ain't room for anything else. You're all right. College won't be able to do you much harm, I reckon. Diana and Anne drove over to Echo Lodge after tea, taking with them all the flowery spoil that several predatory expeditions in their own and neighbors' gardens had yielded. They found the stone house agog with excitement. Charlotta IV was flying around with such vim and briskness that her blue bow seemed to really possess the power of being everywhere at once. Like the helmet of Navarre, Charlotte's blue bows waved ever in the thickest of the fray. Praise be to goodness you've come, she said devoutly, for there's heaps of things to do, and the frosting on the cake won't harden, and there's all the silver to be rubbed up yet, and the horsehair trunk to be packed. And the roosters for the chicken salad are running out there being at the hen house yet crowing, Miss Shirley, ma'am. And Miss Lavender ain't to be trusted to do a thing. I was thankful when Mr. Irving came by a few minutes ago and took her off for a walk in the woods. Courtin's all right in its place, Miss Shirley, ma'am. But if you try and mix it up with cooking and scouring, everything's spoiled. That's my opinion, Miss Shirley, ma'am. Anne and Diana worked so heartily that by 10 o'clock even Charlotta IV was satisfied. She braided her hair in innumerable plates and took her weary little bones off to bed. But I'm sure I shan't sleep a blessed wink, Miss Shirley, ma'am, for fear that something will go wrong at the last minute. The cream won't whip, or Mr. Irving will have a stroke and not be able to come. 
He isn't in the habit of having strokes, is he? Asked Diana, the dimpled corners of her mouth twitching. To Diana, Charlotta IV was, if not exactly a thing of beauty, certainly a joy forever. They're not things that go by habit, said Charlotta IV with dignity. They just happen. And there you are. Anybody can have a stroke. You don't have to learn how. Mr. Irving looks a lot like an uncle of mine that had one just as he were sitting down to dinner one day. But maybe everything will go all right. In this world, you've just got to hope for the best and prepare for the worst and take whatever God sends. The only thing I'm worried about is that it won't be fine tomorrow, said Diana. Uncle Abe predicted rain for the middle of the week, and ever since the big storm, I can't help believing there's a good deal in what Uncle Abe says. Anne, who knew better than Diana just how much Uncle Abe had to do with the storm, was not much disturbed by this. She slept the sleep of the just and weary, and was aroused at an unearthly hour by Charlotte the Fourth. Oh, Miss Shirley, ma'am, it's awful to call you so early, came the wailing through the keyhole. But there's so much to do yet, and oh, Miss Shirley, ma'am, I'm scared it's going to rain, and I wish you'd get up and tell me you think it ain't. Anne flew to the window, hoping against hope that Charlotta the Fourth was saying this merely by way of rousing her effectively. But alas, the morning did look unpropitious. Below the window, Miss Lavender's garden, which should have been a glory of pale virgin sunshine, lay dim and windless, and the sky over the firs was dark with moody clouds. "'Isn't it too mean?' said Diana. "'We must hope for the best,' said Anne determinedly. "'If only it doesn't exactly rain. "'A cool, pearly gray day like this would be nicer than hot sunshine.' But it will rain, mourned Charlotta, creeping into the room, a figure of fun with her many braids wound around her head, tied up with white threads sticking out in all directions. It'll hold off till the last minute and then pour cats and dogs. And all the folks will get sopping and track mud all over the house. Then they won't be able to get married under the honeysuckle, and it's awfully unlucky for no sun to shine on a bride. Say what you will, Miss Shirley, ma'am. I knew things were going too well to last. Charlotta the Fourth seems certainly to have borrowed a leaf out of Miss Eliza Andrews book. It did not rain, though it kept on looking as if it meant to. By noon the rooms were decorated, the table beautifully laid, and upstairs was, was waiting a bride, adorned for her husband. You do look sweet, said Anne rapturously. Lovely, echoed Diana. Everything's ready, Miss Shirley, ma'am, and nothing dreadful has happened yet, was Charlotta's cheerful statement as she betook herself to her little back room to dress. Out came all the braids. The resultant rampant crinkliness was plaited into two tails and tied not with two bows alone, but with four of brand new ribbon, brightly blue. The two upper bows rather gave the impression of overgrown wings sprouting from Charlotta's neck somewhat after the fashion of Raphael's cherubs. But Charlotta the Fourth thought them very beautiful, and after she had rustled into a white dress so stiffly starched that it could stand alone, she surveyed herself in her glass with great satisfaction. A satisfaction which lasted until she went out in the hall and caught a glimpse through the spare room of a tall girl in some softly clinging gown, pinning white star-like flowers on the smooth ripples of her ruddy hair. Oh, I'll never be able to look like Miss Shirley, thought poor Charlotta despairingly. You just have to be born so, I guess. Don't seem as if any amount of practice could give you that air. By one o'clock the guests had come, including Mr. and Mrs. Allen, for Mr. Allen was to perform the ceremony in the absence of the Grafton minister on his vacation. There was no formality about the marriage. Miss Lavender came down the stairs to meet her bridegroom at the foot, and as he took her hand, she lifted her big brown eyes to his with a look that made Charlotta the Fourth, who intercepted it, feel queerer than ever. They went out to the honeysuckle arbor, where Mr. Allen was awaiting them. The guests grouped themselves as they pleased. Anne and Diana stood by the old stone bench, with Charlotta the Fourth between them, desperately clutching their hands in her cold, tremulous little paws. Mr. Allen opened his blue book, and the ceremony proceeded. Just as Miss Lavender and Stephen Irving were pronounced man and wife, a very beautiful and symbolic thing happened. 
the sun suddenly burst through the gray and poured a flood of radiance on the happy bride. Instantly, the garden was alive with dancing shadows and flickering lights. What a lovely omen, thought Anne, as she ran to kiss the bride. Then the three girls left the rest of the guests laughing around the bridal pair while they flew into the house to see that all was in readiness for the feast. Thanks be to goodness it's over, Miss Shirley, ma'am, breathed Charlotta the Fourth, and they's married safe and sound, no matter what happens now. The bags of rice are in the pantry, ma'am, and the old shoes are tied behind the door, and the cream for the whipping is on the cellar steps. At half past two, Mr. and Mrs. Irving left, and everybody went to Bright River to see them off on the afternoon train. As Miss Lavender, I beg her pardon, Mrs. Irving, stepped from the door of her old home, Gilbert and the girls threw rice, and Charlotta the Fourth hurled an old shoe with such excellent aim that she struck Mr. Allen squarely on the head, but it was reserved for Paul to give the prettiest send-off. He popped out of the porch, ringing furiously a, a huge old brass dinner bell which had adorned the dining room mantel. Paul's only motive was to make a joyful noise, but as the clangor died away, from point and curve and hill across the river came the chime of fairy wedding bells, ringing clearly, sweetly, faintly and more faint, as if Miss Lavender's beloved echoes were bidding her greeting and farewell. And so amid this benediction of sweet sounds, Miss Lavender drove away from the old life of dreams and make-believes to a fuller life of realities in the busy world beyond. Two hours later, Anne and Charlotta the Fourth came down the lane again. Gilbert had gone to West Grafton on an errand and Diana had to keep an engagement at home. Anne and Charlotta had come back to put things in order and lock up the little stone house. The garden was a pool of late golden sunshine with butterflies hovering and bees booming, but the little house had already that indefinable air of desolation which always follows a festivity. Oh dear me, don't it look lonesome? sniffed Charlotta the Fourth, who had been crying all the way home from the station. A wedding ain't much cheerfuller than a funeral after all, when it's all over, Miss Shirley, ma'am. A busy evening followed. The decorations had to be removed, the dishes washed, the uneaten delicacies packed into a basket for the delectation of Charlotta the Fourth's young brothers at home. Anne would not rest until everything was in apple pie order. After Charlotta had gone home with her plunder, Anne went over the still rooms, feeling like one who trod alone some banquet hall deserted, and closed the blinds. Then she locked the door and sat down under the silver poplar to wait for Gilbert, feeling very tired but still unweariedly thinking long, long thoughts. What are you thinking of, Anne? asked Gilbert coming down the walk. He had left his horse and buggy out at the road. Of Miss Lavender and Mr. Irving, answered Anne dreamily. Isn't it beautiful to think how everything has turned out? How they have come together again after all the years of separation and misunderstanding? Yes, it's beautiful, said Gilbert, looking steadily down into Anne's uplifted face. But wouldn't it have been more beautiful still, Anne, if there had been no separation or misunderstanding? If they had come hand in hand all the way through life, with no memories behind them but those which belonged to each other. For a moment Anne's heart fluttered queerly, and for the first time her eyes faltered under Gilbert's gaze, and a rosy flush stained the paleness of her face. It was as if a veil that had hung before her inner consciousness had been lifted, giving to her view a revelation of unsuspected feelings and realities. Perhaps, after all, romance did not come into one's life with pomp and blare like a gay knight riding down. Perhaps it crept to one side like an old friend through quiet ways. Perhaps it revealed itself in seeming prose until some shaft of illumination flung athwart its pages betrayed the rhythm and the music. Perhaps, perhaps, love unfolded naturally out of a beautiful friendship as a golden-hearted rose slipping from its green sheath. Then the veil dropped again, but Anne who walked up the dark lane was not quite the same Anne who had driven gaily down it the evening before. The page of girlhood had been turned, 
as if by an unseen finger, and the page of womanhood was before her with all its charm and mystery, its pain and gladness. Gilbert wisely said nothing more, but in his silence he read the history of the next four years in the light of Anne's remembered blush. Four years of earnest, happy work. And then the guerdon of useful knowledge gained and a sweetheart won. Behind them in the garden, the little stone house brooded among the shadows. It was lonely, but not forsaken. It had not yet done with dreams and laughter and the joy of life. There were to be future summers for the little stone house. Meanwhile, it could wait. And over the river, in the purple durance, the echoes bided their time. <laughs>